Welcome everyone to the first edition of the Meet iTobos webinar series. iTobos is a European project that we are involved in and we meaning the Melanoma Patient Network Europe. And we think it is a fascinating project. iTobos actually stands for Intelligent Total Body Scanner for Early Detection of Melanoma and is a research and innovation action that is funded under the Horizon 2020 program, so the previous funding program of the European Union. And it is a fascinating project because it has a quite diverse group of participants from very technical over clinical trials to impact assessment and ethical concerns. And that makes it a really interesting group to work with. So we thought we would like to share some insights and give you some access to this fantastic consortium and the brain that is in there, because we have learned an incredible lot. And something that we always get as feedback from our own community is that people would like to know and understand more about the projects we're involved in as an organization. So without further further ado, I would now therefore like over um, like to see Abigail, or oh, there's Abigail, who is our first guest today. And we're delighted to have you here. Thank you for agreeing that you're the first one. Uh, we, we are very much um, looking forward to hear what you have to share because Abigail has taught us a lot about data privacy and anonymization. And that might not sound so obvious, but it is actually something that is highly relevant for patients and especially also for patient advocates, because I'm sure you will have followed the current policy debate on the topic. So Abigail, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, and then, of course, what your role in iTobos is, and then tell us more about this topic you've been working on for such a long time. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Abigail Goldstein. I've been working at um, IBM Research. I'm a research scientist at IBM uh, for the past 16 years, um, ever since I was an undergraduate student, actually. Um, and almost during that whole period, I've been working on some aspect or other of uh, data privacy. Uh, I've worked on topics such as uh, masking methods, data classification, um, consent management, um, and recently gone into the topic of AI privacy. Um, I currently lead a small team um, that's researching privacy aspects of machine learning models. Um, which is less the focus of this talk, but I will touch on it a little bit um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and we deal with both classical machine learning models as well as large language models, such as uh, probably everyone has heard of ChatGPT and things like that. Um, so that's the most recent stuff that I've been working on. Um, in the iTabas project, IBM is basically providing technology for preserving the privacy of patient data. Um, and this is both in the data sets itself, themselves, uh, if you know they need to be shared or published, um, as well as the resulting AI models. Um, and I'm going to start with my talk on data privacy and anonymization. And I just wanted to say that I'm uh, happy to take questions during the presentation. If anyone has you know, anything that they want to ask, feel free to stop me, but just know that you'll be on the recording if you ask um, during the presentation, at the end, there will be some more time uh, for non-recorded questions. Um, so let's start. So I start with talking a little bit about what privacy is, basically. Um, and the word privacy is a very broad term. Um, and it usually has a lot of cultural and even individual aspects to it. So it depends on what specific people consider as private or as sensitive or as things that they don't want to share with the world. Um, when we talk about data privacy, this is a more technical term um, that usually relates to how to preserve certain pieces of data um, from being discovered you know, for, by people who aren't supposed to know about them. Um, and, and, and in the business context, how to deal with or maintain uh, data sets uh, that contain personal information without you know revealing this data you know to wider society or again to parties who should not um, access that data. Um, and in terms of types of personal information, um, usually there are two definitions that are used, but again it can vary um, geographically and 
depending on specific regulations that are, that are covering or governing this type of data, but typically um, personally identifying information, which is PII for short, is usually directly identifying information such as a person's name or their address. And the term personal information has you know, a wider definition and it's basically any information that can be linked to a person and not necessarily something that's a direct identifier. Um, so this can be even browsing history or medical test results or a person's IP address or a lot of different things. And there's another kind of, again, context specific definition of sensitive information. Um, and again, in GDPR, for example, specific types of personal information are defined as this special type of personal information, which is also considered sensitive. Um, but different regulations relate to this a bit differently. Um, and medical information under GDPR uh, and genetic information is considered sensitive personal information. So like I said, privacy is kind of depends on the person and you know what they expect. Um, and a lot of times people think or say even, you know, I don't have anything to hide. Uh, I don't have any privacy expectations. Uh, everything is out there anyway. And that's true in, in a lot of cases, um, especially with these social networks of people publishing photos and videos and et cetera. Um, but typically there are still some types of information that people would prefer not the whole world to know. Um, so for example, personal messages or details about my bank account or medical or DNA testing results. Um, these are things that most people would consider private information. Again, it depends on the person and, and, and on the context. Um, so what, what is anonymization and basically why is it needed? So um, when you look at a data set um, that contains personal information, you may think that because it doesn't contain, you know, direct identifiers of people like their names, um, it would be okay to publish it as is um, because, you know, you don't know who the people are. So maybe this is considered anonymized data and it's okay. Um, but there have been a, a few uh, very high profile cases, let's say, uh, where such data sets were published and it turned out that someone was able to reverse engineer uh, and, you know, discover specific people within, within that data. Um, so that typically happens when you can cross reference the data set with other external data and use that to be able to re-identify people. Um, and one kind of famous case was there was this Netflix challenge um, when they just started out as a streaming service. Um, they wanted to improve their recommendations of what people should watch. And every year they published um, viewing data of their you know, consumers um, and asked you know, research or data scientists across the world to see if they could help improve their, their viewing recommendations. Um, and again, the data did not contain any direct identifiers. It only contained, you know, what a person watched. Um, but it turns out that crossing this data with an additional database of IMDb, uh, which contains, you know, movie reviews, uh, it was, you know, possible to re-identify at least some of the people and, you know, really link a name to, to, to specific records in the, in the database. Um, and by the way, after that uh, story came out, they canceled the, the challenge. Um, another kind of well-known story uh, was the taxi company in New York uh, published, again, you know, seemingly anonymous data of rides, you know, from where to where, at what time, how much the person paid, uh, what the tip was to the driver and the license plate number of the taxi. Again, supposedly not really revealing anything about people, uh, but it, some you know, industrious uh, people in the world uh, decided to cross-reference this information with celebrity photos that they found online and were able to reveal you know, how much a certain celebrity tipped their cab driver on a given day. Um, so these are just some you know, interesting stories that show that just removing 
direct identifiers from a data set doesn't actually constitute a strong anonymization. Um, and these are the definitions given in the GDPR data protection regulation. Um, so there are two relevant recitals here um, that refer to anonymous information and pseudonymous information. And it's really important to distinguish between these two things. So anonymous information is information that really by no, um, and I don't wanna say possible, but by no likely means can a person be re-identified from that data set? And that means directly or indirectly. Um, so again, in our example of the Netflix and the New York taxi company uh, data, that was not performed you know, well enough. The data was not truly anonymous. It was on the other hand, pseudonymous. So it didn't contain direct identifiers or if there are direct identifiers of people, these can be um, transformed into a new kind of non-identifying field that's still considered pseudonymization under GDPR. And it's recommended to do that if possible because it does reduce the risk of re-identification, but it doesn't eliminate it completely. And so the regulation really does a complete separation between these two things where pseudonymized data is still considered personal information under GDPR and needs to be safeguards and needs to be, you know, uh, consent gathered and if, you know, right to be forgotten and, and all of these different things that the GDPR um, mandates are relevant for pseudonymized data as well. Anonymous information is no longer considered personal information. So that's a much stronger process to make sure that it's really, really unlikely that a person can be singled out or re-identified from the data set. But if you're able to achieve that, then you know all of the clauses of GDPR no longer apply and you can basically use this data as you wish. So that's a very important distinction to make. And I just wanna say that there are additional regulations such as um, the one in California that also makes a similar distinction. Um, they call it de-identified, but they mainly uh, define it in the same way as GDPR defines anonymous data. Um, this is a kind of guide to de-identification published by the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, and it shows a bigger scale. So there are other things here besides only just anonymous and pseudonymous. They have other um, you know, levels on this scale. Uh, but you can see that you know, to, to the most left, is you know explicit personal information without anything being applied to it and anonymous information is you know way over to the right pseudonymous is somewhere in the middle so that's you know how those two things are considered in terms of privacy um, and a few more important distinctions between pseudonymization and anonymization on on the technical level so typically when performing pseudonymization uh, you would only treat direct identifiers such as names or IDs, uh, patient IDs it can also be, but something that is really an identifying feature. Whereas when doing anonymization, you also need to treat indirect identifiers. So examples of indirect identifiers are um, attributes that, for example, each one on its own doesn't necessarily identify a single person, but when you're combining them, they can identify a single person, or when combining them and cross-referencing them with an additional publicly available data set, um, you're able to re-identify the person. So those are what we call indirect identifiers, and you have to deal with those as well if you want the data to be truly anonymized. Um, when we're dealing with pseudonymization, we usually really remove or replace the identifying data and put something that's completely illegible instead. Um, it could be just asterisks, for example, or if you want to um, keep you know, the one-to-one -one mapping between the original uh, records and the new records, then you can use, for example, a hash, which is just you know, a bunch of um, letters and, and numbers that you can't really discern anything from. When you're anonymizing, since you're touching a lot more of the data, but you still want it to be useful, 
typically you what you do is you generalize the data. So you want to make it less specific. You want to make uh, more people look similar to each other, but still have some value in the information that's left. So for example, if it's a numerical value, you can turn it from an exact value to a range, from an exact age to a 10 year range of ages. And that way, the information is less detailed, less specific, but still useful for some kinds of analysis, at least. Um, for categorical data, again, you can group several categories together to make a group that looks the same in terms of the data set, but still has some meaning. Still, um, you can use this to do some useful analysis. Um, when pseudonymizing, uh, it's often the case that you can uh, given some additional information that's stored somewhere else, return to the original values. So for example, a lot of time you, you, you can use a lookup table. It, for example, let's say I'm um, pseudonymizing a patient ID because I want to publish some medical information, but I want to be able to go back and identify the real patient if, if I need to, if there's a medical need to do that. So I would keep you know on the side a mapping between the original ID and the new ID that I've assigned, so that if needed, I can go back there and map it back. So again, that is okay in terms of pseudonymization. With anonymous, anonymized data, that's not possible. So if you're storing a key or a lookup table somewhere um, that could be available to perform re-identification, this isn't considered truly anonymous data. Um, and the last thing, I, I mentioned this a little bit, is that with anonymized data, a lot of time you can still perform some kind of analysis on these fields. There will be a loss in utility because you know, maybe you can't you know, reach the exact um, amount of accuracy that you had with the range uh, as opposed to an exact value, but you can still possibly do something useful. Whereas in pseudonymization, the new values are just kind of placeholders um, they don't really hold any utility. Um, so this is an example to demonstrate what pseudonymization can look like. Um, and it's using a masking tool uh, that IBM has developed and we're using in the ITABAS project. Um, and what it does is it, um, you know, you can define where in your data are the fields that you want to mask out. Um, and you you can just replace each of those values with a new value, an illegible value. Um, it can be reversible or irreversible. Again, we mentioned that pseudonymization can be uh, reversible. Um, and the new values just look like nothing. So in the two examples on the right, you can see um, we had a string that we you know mapped to this kind of token of numbers and letters that doesn't have any meaning. Um, and this ID number was just replaced with, with these asterisks. Again, the idea is to hide the information and not to do something with this new value that we've put in. Again, if there are any questions, you can feel free to stop me. Um, and this is what anonymization looks like. So again, this is a much stronger uh, notion of privacy. It entails you know, a more complex process to achieve. Um, and basically what we do is we divide the columns or the features in the data to three types. One is the PII or the directly identifying information um, that we can either just remove from the data or mask it the way I showed in the previous slide. Then we have what we call quasi-identifiers. Quasi-identifiers are those indirect identifiers that maybe when used together or when cross-referencing with another data set, um, they can in some cases re-identify someone. So again, they're not identifiers per se, they're quasi-identifiers. And then we have sensitive attributes, which are the information that a person does not want you know, associated with them. Um, and so in this example, we have an ID and a name. Those are the direct identifiers. Our quasi-identifiers are gender, birth, country, and age, and the sensitive attribute is the disease. Why do we specifically refer to the sensitive attribute? Because we're going to see in a moment that the process of k-anonymity, which is a form of anonymization, is going to take groups of records and basically make them 
indistinguishable from each other. And I'll show an example of this in the next slide. But if we have a, such a group of people who all look the same and who can't distinguish between them, but they all, for example, have the same disease, then you haven't really hidden that sensitive information that you're trying to hide. Because if you know that a person belongs to that group, you automatically know what disease they have. So typically, if we have such sensitive attributes, they also require um, dealing with them specifically to make sure that we don't have groups that have a significantly different distribution of the sensitive attribute than the overall data. So if, for example, we have two diseases in the data set and they're more or less 50-50 across the data set, we, are, we want to strive to have each of our you know, anonymity groups also distributed in a similar manner in terms of the disease. Um, canonymity is typically performed on an entire data set at once with the goal of releasing it, like same as the Netflix um, example. And um, again, we want to try to maintain utility as much as possible. So we're going to do the minimum amount of perturbation or of generalization that is required to be able to achieve our, our privacy um, goal or our privacy guarantee. And like I mentioned earlier, privacy and utility almost always come as a trade-off to each other. So if you have perfect privacy, you know, everything is asterisks, you can't do anything with the data, there's no utility. On the other hand, perfect utility doesn't provide any privacy and you're going to be somewhere on that scale and deciding where on the scale you want to be depends on the context, depends on the you know level of sensitivity of the data, depends on you know who is going to be able to access that data, et cetera. So it's not you know a clear cut answer of where you need to be on that um, scale. Um, and now I'll I'll show you what anonymity actually looks like. So let's assume that we have this small table. Um, and we've defined the first three columns, zip code, gender, and age, as our quasi-identifiers. And we're going to use a K value of three. K is the privacy parameter that determines how many people are going to be in each of these indistinguishable groups. And on the bottom, you can see the result of what that looks like. So basically turns these six records into two groups of three where if you look at the first three columns, all of the people within the group look the same. So in this light blue group, everyone has the same you know, beginning of a zip code. Uh, we don't know what gender they are and their age group is between 35 and 39. The second grayish group um, has this beginning of a zip code and a different age range. Um, so what we've achieved here is basically a three anonymization of this you know, small example data set. The higher the K is, the better the privacy guarantee is going to be because you have more and more people who look the same. It's going to be more and more difficult to re-identify a specific person in that group. And we can also see here examples of what a generalization looks like for a numeric feature versus what a generalization looks like for a categorical feature. So instead of the categories male and female, we combine them both together to person, uh, which represents both genders. Okay, so going back to our examples, um, these data sets were indeed stripped of their direct identifiers. So you could say they were pseudonymized, but they were not truly anonymized because it turns out that a person's streaming service viewing history is in fact an indirect identifier of that person. Um, you know, people, you know, cross-reference this with, with other information and we're able to identify people. So that the, the flaw here was a design flaw. The Netflix uh, organization didn't realize that this information actually was potentially identifying. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot of things that don't seem like they uh, could or should be uh, identifying people, uh, but it's it's been proven that they are. So a person's browsing history, a person's history of online purchases, a person's blood test results. I think even it was proven that just looking at 
three um, blood pressure measurements along with their dates, or five, I don't remember the exact number, uh, was enough to identify people. So you have to be really careful and defining what the quasi-identifiers are. Um, and also, as I mentioned, it can be combinations of features and not just a single one. So it's been shown in the US, for example, that the combination of age, gender, and zip code is uniquely identifying of you know, a large proportion of the population. Um, so these are just some general you know, tips when it comes to anonymization. Um, what helps to better anonymize a data set and versus what you know, makes it more difficult. So the smaller the data set is in terms of how many samples are there, the harder it's going to be to anonymize because um, you're going to be you're going to have to perform more generalizations to be able to uh, you know group people together since there, there are only a small number of samples. Um, also, I think it makes sense the more quasi identifiers you have, the harder it's going to be to, to anonymize because you have more information that you need to now look the same you know, inside the group. Um, and also if you have very uniquely distributed or sparse data, that's also going to be extremely difficult to anonymize. So what do I mean by sparse data? If you have a lot of columns, but only a few of them are actually filled with some value, like in the example here, it's going to be a very high degree of uniqueness um, between the samples and therefore, again, making them look similar, you're going to lose a lot of information. And the last thing that makes it diff very difficult to anonymize data set are outliers. Outliers are specific samples that are kind of very far out away from the normal distribution of the data. So there's an example that people always give of salaries. If you have like a table of, you know, how much people make in a company, uh, the CEO's salary is probably going to be much higher than the rest. And therefore, to be able to anonymize that data set as a whole is going to be very difficult. Um, sometimes the best solution is to just take those outliers out, um, assuming there are only a few of them. Um, any questions about you know, data masking, pseudonymization, and anonymization before I continue to the next topic? Um, hi, Abigail. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Violeta here, I was wondering if a uh, rare disease could be an outlier. Yes, uh, uh, yes, it can. So yeah. outlier is defined as something that's different from the other data points in yeah. the data set. If everyone in the data set has that rare disease, it's, it's not much of an outlier, but if it's only one or two people, then yes. Okay, so now I'm gonna give a little bit of a teaser, let's say, uh, to a different, or let's say more advanced topic um, that we're also working on uh, in ITABAS, um, and it deals with machine learning uh, models. Um, and since I didn't know, you know how much background people here have, um, I just have a really short intro to what machine learning is, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, so machine learning is becoming more and more prominent in our day-to-day -day lives. It's used in lots of different you know, use cases and scenarios, um, including finance, uh, medical diagnosis, and, and many, many more. Um, and really, in a nutshell, the idea is to be able to learn from existing data what to do with new data. So if I have data that, um, for example, if we're talking about diseases, I have a data set where I know what you know people's diseases are, uh, along with all the other information that that I have about the person, um, like their test results and 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 et cetera and et cetera. Um, I can train a model on that data, which we call training data, to be able to distinguish between um, the different diseases, and then giving a new person's information without knowing what disease they have, the model should be able to, from the information that it learned, predict what the correct disease is for that person. So as opposed to a rule-based system where we tell, like we code an algorithm that says exactly how to um, identify a specific disease, 
Here, the algorithm is basically teaching itself how to distinguish between the different diseases based on the information that it's seen when it was trained. And um, so we have the training phase and the prediction phase. The prediction phase is when we have new data for which we don't know the answer, and um, we're trying to predict you know, what, what, the, what the correct answer is. Um, there's often also what we call a validation set, which is used to um, measure how well the model is performing. So uh, you leave some of your data aside, not use it in the training, um, and then check if the model is able to accurately predict the right answer um, on the data that it hasn't seen before. Any questions about that? OK. Um, so it turns out that machine learning models are just another way to um, carry information. And in a similar manner that we were able to attack and re-identify people from the Netflix data set, for example, it's also possible to re-identify people and to learn private or personal information about the training data of a model just from the model itself. So even though it's aggregated information and it's something that's been computed on individual samples and it's not even the data set itself, um, still you can learn things about people just from that model. Um, and this is a, a research field that has started uh, about five to six years ago. And um, there are different attacks that have been published um, that are able to deduce information from a trained machine learning model. And basically that's um, the, the new area that uh, my team is, is researching right now. And we're also introducing into ITABAS um, technologies related to privacy and machine learning, um, but I'm not gonna talk about this in detail today, maybe in a future talk. Um, so just to summarize the things that IBM is contributing and my team is contributing to the ITABAS project. So there's the data masking tool, the one that I showed at the very beginning that does pseudonymization of data. Um, then we have tools for anonymizing both data sets and the machine learning models that are trained on them. And finally, we also have a tool for um, applying data minimization to machine learning models. This basically means once I've trained a model on, let's say all the information that I had at hand, um, because I don't always know, you know beforehand what's going to be important and you know what are the features that the model is going to need to be able to make accurate pr predictions. Once I have that model, I can do some analysis to um, discover if maybe I don't really need all of the data that I used to begin with. And that way we can achieve data minimization even when dealing with machine learning models. And the final thing that I wanted to mention is that my team is also contributing uh, to open source projects. Um, so there are basically two main projects that, that you know, we're contributing our code to. One is called the AI Privacy Toolkit that contains mainly um, defenses and mitigations against privacy risks for AI models. It contains, for example, um, the uh, model anonymization and data minimization tools that I mentioned here. And the second open source project is called Adversarial Robustness Toolbox. And there we've contributed different attacks on machine learning models so that um, organizations or consortiums um, can assess how vulnerable their models are uh, before, for example, publishing them or sharing them with third parties. And that's about all I had. So thank you for listening. And thank, thank you so much for that, Abigail. Questions? Uh, are there any questions for Abigail? It's, could you please, someone just spoke. Hi, I didn't speak. But I have a question. Hello. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Abigail. Great presentation. I thank loved you. it. I, I was uh, driving the car, and so I, I missed some some spots. First question: Can we have the recording of this session? Yeah, I think Absolutely. it's going to be made available. That's awesome. The uh, second question: So in an ideal world, um, we are 
supporting families affected by hereditary cancer syndromes. So they are uh, they are also quite rare syndromes in in our community. So it's very difficult with the pseudo anonymization of the data because we we need to generate data to gain knowledge, right? We want to improve care of uh, genetic mutation carriers and hereditary cancer patients. And in the ideal world, we would even imagine to link our patient-centered, patient-led patient registry, which is a tool we provide for our community and for anybody worried about the cancer risk. We want that people learn uh, about their cancer risk and uh, manage better their their risk um, and their condition. In an ideal world, we would like to link the Evita platform to biobanks, you know, because the whole picture of a personalized cancer risk uh, needs to have more than biological samples and uh, the natural history of condition or disease is crucial to learn more and better about the ideal treatment and management of a condition or disease. The interoperability with other systems, I, I'm a nurse by education, I have no idea how does that work? How does it guarantee for both sides that uh, it's all confirm uh, regulations and uh, necessary protection? Um, and and how, how is it done in, in the practice, the interoperability between systems? I mean, this is a very new journey for us. We are meeting since five years over this project, 24-7. Uh, we we uh, get up in the morning with the project and we, we lay down at night with the project in our head. And we spend a lot of money on this project also. So uh, we are... We, are, we need a, a guidance to go safely through this whole process because there are, there are stuff we don't even dream about. You know, For example, we have a kind of risk assessment tool on our platform where we ask nine questions to the user. The user is the only uh, uh, administrator and manager of his own data, okay? So nobody interferes, um, but... We, we do this nine questions, and if there is one answer with yes, we advise to have a genetic counseling. Are we already a medical device? There is regulation about this. And, and I just found out by coincidence because of the con conference I went to. So this is a, a very complex process, and, and I, I don't know if there exists some guidance on the production of a patient-led patient registry so we can do every step how we need to do it to be safe and to to also um, assure the data protection for our users. We have a lawyer on board that is professionalized in, in data protection, but uh, yeah, there is so many stuff that we don't know. And I, I think it would be great to have a toolkit on this kind of stuff so patient can generate their own data because this is a knowledge that is crucial to progression and development. Sorry for the long talk. <laughs> no, I think you just got yourself a job, <laughs> Tamara. What? I think you just got yourself a job. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't need more work in fact. <laughs> I think who, who would? <laughs> yeah. So if that was okay, um, before I stop the recording now, um, I would like to just like some reflections for you. And um, so I think it was quite interesting to the both examples that you, you shared from Netflix and the, and the cab drivers, that the original intent wasn't malicious. Right. Because I think we always assume that there was someone like with bad intent sharing something in order to hurt someone. But both examples that you gave were actually rather the opposite. It was rather trying to have a, like an open process or to be informative. So it was rather good intent gone wrong. Is that something that you think is frequent? Something that you've seen before? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. A lot of people are just not aware of the risks. 
Um, and so again, they, they, like you said, no one meant to, to you know, violate anyone's privacy. They just didn't know that what they were doing is risky. And I think that's pretty common. Um, that's why I think a lot of at least large organizations now have you know chief security officers and chief privacy officers and chief risk officers and a lot of different roles there to make sure that this stuff doesn't happen uh i'm afraid that in smaller companies like smes or even you know re research organizations um probably don't don't have those in place so there's, there's still a bit at risk i think I just have a question also a little bit because you tantalized us at the end with uh, the, the whole machine learning thing. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, I, I watched a really great talk last week on, on from HAI at Stanford on the sort of good and bad of what was happening in the EU AI legislation. And one of the biggies that came out, I think, was that how do we ensure that these models have you know, access to these models by researchers to really assess and evaluate them and you know because we know you know it's, it can be you know we are very effective as people with skin in the game to ensure like quality in research so i think we need to have this kind of end user i think tamara was a little bit alluding to that too um to be able to push the quality um and the other thing i wanted to just put to you is can we have a mandate for technical and ethical standards because i think in gdpr we kind of missed it a bit because we had the sort of legal definitions um because for us you know if, if well for everyone really the feeling safe is about knowing that there's like sufficient checks and, and retribution when people do things that go wrong so kind of two related questions let's say so I'm not an expert on, on regulations, but I, I think most of them tend to, like you say, not go into very technical details on how to do things. Um, they define stuff on a high level and then basically leave it up to the technical community to come up with solutions and the courts to decide whether those solutions were adequate or not. I think the same goes for the new AI Act. As far as I know, it doesn't contain real you know technical specifics on on how to do things just you know at a high level what should be done um i think there are more let's say niche um legislations that relate to a really specific thing and there they have a better definition like there's hipaa in the us that defines you know exactly the specific fields and exactly what you need to do with them in order to be hipaa compliant um, but there aren't a whole lot of those. Uh, most of the regulations are are much more high level, and I think it's I think it's done on purpose. I mean, they they want to make sure that the regulation stands the test of time, and not, you know, trying to run after something that's constantly changing because the technology is going to evolve all the time. And I don't remember what the first question was, but if if you want if you still want me to answer it, then. <laughs> repeat it no please. you you kind of you kind of answered it anyway okay. it was just it, it was just about model access i mean uh, you know people who know i want people who know that are independent to be able to look at these or have access to these models as they develop to be able to say yeah, yes so that's, that's right yeah that is something that the regulation could define um and i think there are regulations that mandate like an external audit that's not from within the organization that's pretty easy to 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 put into a regulation. I, I don't think it's there at the moment though. Um, not as far as I know, but again, I'm not an expert. So something to build, to build a little bit on something that both Gilly and Tamara said is, um, so you spoke a lot about what one can do in order to minimize the risk or what one has to do in order not to expose people or patients to risk. So assuming that I'm, so 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 the struggle we are having in our community is that we feel that a lot is at the moment simply blocked because people are afraid to do something wrong. So we know things can go wrong and that has led to this fear that we just basically block everything. So for someone we are in cancer, our people are still dying. So we are desperate for solutions and just blocking everything is of course something that is no solution for us. So we're after mitigation in a way, fully acknowledging that one can do one's best, 
but even with good intent, something will go wrong. So what? So we're thinking rather now as, as the next step. So how can we watch what's ongoing and how can we then act if something goes wrong? Do you have any thoughts on that? So do one, do the best we can right now, but just accept something will go wrong, but that we can still then protect people at the next step. So can you have you some thoughts on that? I think there are two there are two aspects to this. The first is, first of all, to know, you know, what exists. And like I said earlier, technology is evolving all of the time. It's mm -hmm. basically a full time job just to, you know, follow what's going on, even if it's a, a, a small and narrow relatively narrow focus. So knowing, you know, all of the technological developments all the time is almost impossible. But again, if, if you want to be using the best kind of technology that matches your needs, um, that's something that someone needs to be doing, um, you know, following what's, what's, what's being published by, by both the academic community and open source and proprietary solutions. Again, it's, it's a big job, but it's necessary if you want to do things the best way possible. And the second thing is there's, I, I don't want to go too technical, but there are different um, ways of going about guaranteeing privacy, some of which are, um, I, I don't remember the word, but they're like, they're, 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 they, they, can, they can guarantee that in the future, no matter what you know, new data is published or a new attack is made available, you still won't be able to reverse engineer and go back to, to the original data. So K-anonymity, the one that I showed you, actually isn't such a technology. It does rely a lot on the definition of the quasi-identifiers. And if you do that wrong and miss something and publish the data, and later it turns out that something that you didn't anonymize is suddenly a possibly identifying field, you're you're screwed. There are other technologies. They all they also have drawbacks. Not that they're perfect, but they have this kind of forward guarantee in that you, it doesn't matter what happens in the environment. The guarantee that you had at the moment of publishing the data is still going to hold. And an example of that is differential privacy. I don't want to go into a lot of details of what that means because it's a it's a bit you know, mathematically heavy, heavy. Um, but the academic community likes this notion of privacy a lot because of those, you know, uh, characteristics. The fact that it's, you know, it's it's forward guaranteeing and that it has like a mathematical definition of privacy. Great. Just, just to come back, sorry, sorry, Bettina, just to come back to, to the to melanoma, I was curious now and the Idobosh project. It's this ambitions or this ambitions of uh, of Idobosh to integrate clinical and the uh, demographic data, but uh, to include as well genetic data into the uh, artificial intelligence assistant. So how we apply here pseudo anonymization and anonymization and other tools that you very nice describe uh, today. So anonymizing genetic data is very, 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 very difficult. Um, the way that iTobas is tackling this is by not directly analyzing the genetic data, but separating it into two phases. So you have a very low level analysis that looks at the more raw level of genetic data and computes a genetic risk score. And then that risk score, which is a single number, is the one that goes into the further analysis where it includes the demographic information and the medical information, et cetera. And that raw genetic data is never you know, released, never shared with any other partners apart from the ones that have done the, 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 the genetic testing. So it's, it's safeguarded at a much higher level um, and only that single risk score that was computed is actually fed into the rest of the process. Um, so that's one way to do this. I'm sure there are, there are other ways, um, but again, it is it is very difficult to deal with genetic data. Great, that was a great question because that had been one of our worries at the project start. Laura has a question. I think that's then the last one for which we have time today. Laura. Hello, uh, thank you Abigail for your 
really good presentation. I really understood the problem and uh, several solutions. Uh, I've got a question that probably was already half answered when you were answering the previous one about uh, storing a risk instead of actually storing the data, but it's mostly about imaging. So when, um, first, when a, when a patient is recruited for one of these studies that's going to use AI um, models on images, uh, they have to uh, give their informed consent. And my first question is, how informed is this informed consent yeah. when most people don't really understand what's going to yeah. be done with their data? And my second part of the question is, how can you anonymize or pseudo-anonymize pseudo images? And what if in the future it would be... Um, uh, a good thing to reanalyze those images if you uh, anonymize them, I suppose, with whatever method. And but in the future, there is a medical solution for a problem, uh, and then we want to go back again to the patient and inform the patient that now there is something we can do for you in the future. How could we do that then? And um, are these problems thought about in these projects? So, so the first question is a, a huge issue with, with consent. I, I agree with you. Um, I think the, so that's not something that I'm in charge of, of the project. There are other partners who have done that. Uh, I think they did dedicate a lot of thought into how to try to make that better understandable by the patients. Um, they created some kind of interactive form where um, kind of read through the, the most important bits, but eventually you still have to sign that, you know, five or six pages long document. Um, I, I don't know if that's, you know, been solved. Um, I know it's a, it's a huge issue, not, not just in the medical domain, but in general. Um, I think, you know, visualizations are usually um, the best type of solution that, that can be applied here to help, you know, um, exemplify maybe the, the risks and things like that. Um, regarding images, um, so I, I can tell you what they're doing in Itabus. Again, this is not my really realm of expertise because our part is more the the, the tabular data, the, 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 like the CSV files. Um, but they, again, they have put a lot of thought into how to do that. So for example, um, instead of having images of large portions of the body, they're cutting the images down into really small patches uh, where you can't really know where, where in the body it was. Um, they are removing directly identifying information such as tattoos and scars and things like that so that if you really have you know, a, a special... Uh, marking on your skin, that's going to be removed before even starting to process the, the image itself. Um, but I mean, I agree, the whole the whole notion of preserving privacy, like I said, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between how useful your, you want your data to be or how important it is for you to preserve the privacy of the patients. And you have to choose something in the middle. It's never going to be a perfect solution. Um, you do your best, I guess. And I think if you put at the prime, which I think GDPR wanted, if you put at the prime level what the patient wants now, may want in the future, um, I think that's a really good place to start along this playing field. And I actually think that this is a perfect um, conclusion of this hour that unfortunately is already over and Abigail I definitely think you're going to come back um, yeah. I hope you do um, I think this if we go home now with this concept of the trade-off so that there is no perfect solution but it is always some kind of decision we have to make and as Gilly just said that this that as us with so much skin in the game uh, literally in this case but also the potential benefit at is also ours. So I think this is a place in the discussion where we as advocates and as patients should have an opinion and to say, because it is us who are there to benefit, but also who are there to be harmed in, in this process. So I think it's a really good 
good food for thought um, for this afternoon. Thanks so much, Abigail. That was great. Um, yeah. People never believe that we say that we have this great person on data anonymization. Um, so that was really, really helpful. I'm sure you're happy to share the slides, right? Because that's always yeah. a question that we're getting. So, and we will make the recording available and we have your email. So we'll get an email once it's online and then you can of course watch it again and share it with your communities. With that, thank you for today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.